Starting up. All right, guys, we're here. We're live. I wasn't sure if this was going to be live because I wasn't sure if we were going to have this on webcam, but here we are. I'm joined again, second time he's been on. Uh, he's the newest Twitch uh, poker streamer, man. He's, he's got him and I think the uh, umbrella cockatoo. I don't know where the umbrella cockatoo went on his shoulder, well, but... Well, you can see her. If you look on, on the uh, upper right-hand side of your screen, you can see her there on the top of her cage. She's... Can you see there? Yeah, I'm I can. A little screen, and I can see her up there on the cage. Yeah, we're joined by we're, we're joined by <laughs> we're joined by Davis Galanski, the Umbrella Cockatoo, and potentially Susan might be making an appearance at some point in time today too. Welcome, welcome, my friend. Thank you. Now, hey, Sue, by the way, not Susan. That's her official name. Her real name is Sue. Oh, so so, so we call her Sue or Here Susan? Here she comes with the bird. Okay. That bird is so cool. So we're, I just want to say we're back live streaming on, on YouTube today, guys. We did Twitch yesterday. We were streaming the prop bet between TC and uh, Dong or Kim. They're not playing today. And we'll be back on another day with that, I think so. So, all right, DS, what's going on, man? What, what's, what's going on with this Twitch streaming now? You're, you're, you've been on there, it looks like, pretty often. I'm getting on there uh, twice a week and possibly more. Uh, I'm pretty much playing uh, uh, no limit hold'em tournaments when I'm on there. Mm -hmm. There's one on Sunday that's a uh, $200 buy-in and it starts at a, well it starts at 3 o'clock in um, Nevada and the first two hours you can buy in for the first two hours and so I'm getting on there after the first hour. So I start at 4. Mm. And on Wednesday night, they have a tournament. They have a nightly tournament there where it costs thirty dollars to buy in, but there's all kinds of rebuys and add-ons. So the average person is probably in almost a hundred dollars in that tournament. Again, the first two hours are uh, people are buying all the way up to the first two hours and rebuying and everything. And then after two hours, the game settles down. I, I get on after the first hour, and a couple times uh, just yesterday, <clears throat> I was in a tournament which I wasn't twitching, but when I made the final table, I I put it on to Twitch since uh, I thought I hadn't had a chance to I hadn't made a final table uh, on the Twitch before that I had made two monies, but one one was like a, a twelfth and one was like an eleventh, and um, I wanted to show a little bit about. Final table strategy, so I put that on there. So, so basically, how, twice a week, twice I'm a week. on there. But I'm not, but I'm not really concentrating on, on on showing people how to play. I'm doing that when something comes up that's interesting. I explain a concept that might be related to what's happening. But I'm also talking about other things. I'm, I was I was teaching a little bit of game theory the other day, and just telling some stories and. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, I'm doing it differently than than most of the other Twitchers who have four screens on board and are describing the games in a very technical style. I'm not trying to be that technical because I'm trying to to address my remarks mainly to the intermediate player who knows a little bit about poker and is thinking about becoming a more serious poker player. I don't, I don't, um, I'm not trying to show off uh, my knowledge of of ranges to guys who are already playing for a living. That's um, that's not the reason why we did this. Two, the two plus two company told me that I should be doing this, and um, maybe we, it will get uh, you, know, you know get us some more customers and get poker some more customers. I know one way you can get on. I'm not even sure exactly how you get on to watch someone twitch. The only way I know how to do it is to go to two plus two. If you go to the <laughs> two plus two dot com site, there's a menu where um, they have names, and you click on the names. That's the only way I know how to do it. Did they make that for you just so you could understand how to go on Twitch? Is that why they implemented this new idea? On no, that was already done before I became a Twitcher. That was done because it's that's something to do with their business model. They they're trying to get Twitch, Twitch and Two Plus Two, or have some kind of a arrangement. Mm. And I, I really don't even bother myself with the details. They just said, look, we're going to come up. They my son and 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 Mike uh, Minkoff came up to to Reno to 
put it together for me, and now, uh, and now, I get on there. I know just as, as a little as I need to know, so I can do what I have to do. Like well, just, I, you know, I didn't know how to get out to Skype. I never had. This is my first Skype in my whole life. Well, technically, we're on Google Hangout. This isn't Skype, so you haven't oh. Skype. Yet. You haven't Skype yet in your life yet. I'm sorry, we What's haven't. The is there a difference between those two things? I mean, it's just a different program. So Google Hangout is just its own separate thing, and then Skype is its. Is there something that I could be doing on Skype that I can't be doing now, or vice versa? Well, do you ever? Well, do you ever? You, your girlfriend's there technically, so I was going to say if you have any long distance relationships, you could be using Skype to have a video conference with them. Okay. Well. Okay. So there's a little more you can do on Skype than doing this, but it doesn't sound like it. I need to know it. I don't. I don't like to learn things that I don't need to know. You don't. You don't. You don't need to know about Skype. Then that's pretty much it. This looks fine to me. <laughs> so wait, uh, Mike. Uh, professional poker is uh, Michael, right? Michael Minkoff. Yeah. He seems I, like he I, didn't, I didn't divulge any any secrets. I think I think enough people know that. He seems he's like a professional at he's like a professional producer, right? He he knows all that he knows all the stuff, right? He knows he knows all kinds of stuff. He has seven Emmys. He's a, a video editor. He has seven Emmys. Not too many people can say that. That is sick. Yeah, I mean, I always I I could enjoy reading his post because his his like credibility on and like having success seems pretty good. So it feels like I I try to like maybe learn something from successful him. with a lot of fields. He works for ESPN and I I am. And he does a little bit of stuff for, for Mason. Mm, cool. Mason is the owner of Two Plus Two. And he's got that cool blue name on Two Plus Two, which not many people have. Professional poker, right? Uh, I'm trying to get the blue name. What do I have to do to get a blue name on Two Plus Two? I have no idea. I don't even know what a blue name is. Again, I don't pay too much attention to that stuff. Is a blue name was? Uh, how many people have blue names? I'm pretty sure like one person has a blue name. Professional. Oh, I don't know. Then I guess maybe it's impossible for more than one to get it. Well, that doesn't seem very fair. All right, guys, we are live streaming this. If you have any questions or comments you want to make throughout, go ahead. Let me know. A couple people want to know what's the name of the bird. Lyric. L Y R I C. Uh, that name was chosen by Sue because when we first got the bird, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. So she started looking through a list of of names that could work for either one, and then we found out a. a about a week later, they did a DNA test. She hmm. liked the name. Okay, so lyric L Y R I C. Like the, lyr the lyrics of the song, yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, for those that don't know who David is, I had him on a podcast before, maybe some months back. David's been around poker quite a long time. He's written a ton of books. He's been involved with Two Plus Two, the biggest uh, poker forum community, for a very long time. I think those are like the two main things. You know, how how else would you, if you were to describe yourself in fifteen seconds or less, how else? What, what else would you say? Well, that's basically true. But the main thing is that I was, I came to poker from a more mathematical and academic type of background than anybody else back when I was playing. Now I'm the least academic. I went from being uh, the the guy who I mean, people didn't have any idea even about probability. Most people didn't even know what that word meant when I started playing poker, and um, let alone game theory. So I uh, realized that there was a lot of things that, about poker that no one was thinking about, and that made me write uh, my first two books. The first one was just about Hold'em, because nobody had ever written about Hold'em, and then I realized the general theory of poker wasn't ever written about, so I wrote that book, uh, which is now The Theory of Poker, which to this day I think is the best-selling uh, uh, poker book, and um, then started, you know, I was gambling for a living. I've been gambling for a living for all these years, sometimes playing blackjack or finding errors in, in casinos, but mainly playing poker. <laughs> finding Here errors in Las Vegas and sometimes California. I like finding errors in casinos. I like the way you put that. Yeah, well, I found a few classic ones um, that I've written about, but I mean, in, in some cases, 
There was just, by the way, there's something in the in the news today that about a um, casino that is trying to get their money back from some gamblers. Mm -hmm. in I don't know if you saw that news. Uh, 1.5 million because the uh, the cards weren't shuffled or something like that. Yeah, I guess they they were just dealing from brand new decks. I don't know. I don't know the whole deal there. That's a little bit different though. That's not finding a mathematical error. That was just finding you know. A person error. Most part. Yeah. yeah. So if you said Theory of Poker, which is the book you wrote. That's the most popular poker book. I think that's that. It's close between that and Harrington on Hold'em and a couple others, but. But that book, um, you know, has sold steady over the years um, because it, it addresses, just like the title says, it doesn't tell you exactly how to play a hand. It tells you about all the different things you need to think about when you're playing the hand. You know, what, how much money is in the pot, what your chances are of improving, what you think he has, what his chances are of improving, what he thinks that you think he has and how every one of the different factors combines to eventually giving you the right decision. And uh, When did you write this book? I think I wrote it originally. Well, the original version of it was like in 1978. It actually had a different title and then I, re then I um, got somebody to help me uh, polish it up a little bit and I think it came out again in around 1980 and it, and it had a, a different title again and finally I, I managed to get it titled The Theory of Poker. The publishers, my original publishers, didn't like that title because um, they thought it would scare people off. And I knew that they were wrong. I knew that the title, The Theory of Poker, w w would not scare people off and, it would, and, and was a better, uh, was explained better what the book is about. And then since then, if you look at the reviews over the years, you'll see that it, it's, it's always gotten great reviews. So that, that's a book that's like a prerequisite for any good poker player. I, I would say at this point that of all the professional poker players in the world, I'd say that more than half have read that book. So that's pretty, pretty cool. It's also been translated into about 10 or 12 languages. It seems like this book was like very far ahead of its time in terms of content and like the, the material written about. Yeah, it was far ahead of its time, but only because the people who were playing poker at the time were so much, so uneducated. Uh, they, they came from the pool hall and, the, and even the criminal backgrounds. Poker used to have a stigma to it, and so the people who would be playing, let's say, bridge or backgammon or chess stayed away from poker for the most part. So not, so, so, um, Poker had never been been analyzed the way that those games had been analyzed, and part of the reason was because they said, "Well, poker is a lot of psychology and bluffing and looking into the other guy's eyes and figuring out what he has and, and that kind of stuff." And they didn't they didn't realize how much uh, you could gain by learning the fundamentals and the and understanding it in a more theoretical way. Now, now everybody understands that, and in fact, has gone past what's in the theory of poker because the theory of poker pretty much assumes that you're going to try to play an exploitive game where you're exploiting people. Now there's all this hyper theory, which is game theory, where where the the main thing is that you don't get yourself exploited, and and um, it's not so much trying to figure out what the other guy has and not so much trying to to deceive your opponent but rather playing this game theory way at least in, at the highest levels on the internet they're doing that so they've actually gone past what I did on, on my book and I don't even think it's a good thing for a variety of reasons but uh, that's another story I believe we, we talked a bit about that last yeah we did uh, uh, Kevin says, uh, David, I'm a No Limit Cash micro fun player. Should I read? Thi oh, yeah. I, by the way, I have to credit you because I've been saying fun player since I first talked to you. On the, like, we recorded like two or three times, and the first time you said fun player instead of the word fish. And I've been using that ever since, and now I've got a lot of other people using that term because you told me it. So i I'm, I got to thank you for you, you teaching me that word. Okay. And fun player doesn't even – I mean, they, they don't – 
Exactly. They're not equivalent. A, a fish is somebody who who is making a lot of who plays terribly, and a fun player is somebody who is playing for fun. And and, and usually a person who's playing for fun isn't going to be playing that well, but he's not necessarily a, a bad player. He could just be somebody who who is um, willing to make. I mean, there's a lot of fun players that if you put a gun to their head and they and you said this is the only way you're going to eat is by playing poker for a living, they would immediately play a little bit differently. And many of the players who who are fun players would um, would become winners. But they don't want to become winners because it's less fun to play in a way that wins. Because if nothing else, you have to uh, you have to uh, play tighter uh, in, in general. Uh, to, to, to be a professional than if you're playing for fun. Now that's not so tr true if you're playing multiple games because now you always have some game where you can be playing or if you're playing one of these um, Zoom type internet games. But if you're playing in a, only one game, even on the internet and even more so if you're playing in a live game, it's not really that fun to play the, the way that you need to play to win because it means that most of the time you're out of the hand and uh, that's one of the sad things about about uh, poker is that if you're trying to have fun, you can't simultaneously have a good chance of winning and, and, and enjoy yourself unless they change the structure on certain games. So that's always been my, what I'm trying to do is change the structure so that you can maybe play three or four out of ten hands and um, still have a good chance of winning. You you mentioned before you were talking to some sites or you're talking to some people about potentially um, helping out or, or encouraging or moving along some type of change like that. Has anything come up with that? Oh. <laughs> what are you doing with the bird? <laughs> uh, she just knocked over my my soda again. Oh no. Yeah. But um, the yeah the, I mean the the uh, the problem. With changing uh, sites, is that players themselves don't know what's best for them, and the reason why they don't is because they learn poker from watching it on TV when uh, while well, they were watching these No Limit games. I mean, No Limit was fairly popular in the in the 70s, and then and then died out because the best players won all the money, mm -hmm. and it only came back again because it's it's. An interesting TV game, but now you get all the new players and they want to play the way they see it on TV, and they play for a while and they uh, they lose interest. It's sort of like the backgammon craze. You probably don't remember it, but for a few years, backgammon was real big. But that was destined to die out because even though it seemed like there was quite a bit of luck in backgammon, there was just too much skill. I mean, you never, there's never going to be a, a chess craze for money. You're, not, you're never going to see people gambling in ch on chess for money because it's too much skill. So the guy who's better is, gonna, is just going to um, win every time. And the same with backgammon. He's going to win pretty quickly. So when there was a craze for it and all these celebrities were playing, a lot of other people started playing, and the, and the, and the best backgammon players cleaned up. And uh, now the same is happening with No Limit Hold'em. In fact, already happened. It's it's already pretty much uh, a done deal. Now tournaments are a little bit different you, because in a tournament, um, you have to play a little bit differently, and a bad player can get lucky. A bad player can really cause a or an aggressive bad player can cause a a, a pro headaches because what because pros don't want to risk all their money as slight favorites in the tournament so if, uh, like for instance uh, Barconi uh, you know he was doing a lot of moving in it's and, also right there Robert Barconi from yes Kevin and he was, forcing, he was forcing the better players to decisions where they were pretty sure they were slight favorite but they didn't really want to be in that in that position I mean if you went into the World Series of Poker um, and you and you moved in on the first hand, and and the other guy knew you had, for the sake of argument, ace king, and he's looking at two queens. 
most pros would just throw their hand away, even though they're 55 or 56 percent. Mm-hmm. So tournaments are are are, are better for, for amateurs than, than cash games, but still I'd I'd like to see more of, of what it used to be. I mean seven card stud, especially with a decent size ante, you cannot analyze it the way that you can analyze hold them. You can't you can't pin someone's range down nearly as much. And um, and the pots are big and it's there's it's just it's just sad that for one, whatever reason, the, the the public doesn't like that game. I mean, I can't force them to like it, but they sure would be better off if they were playing more more uh, games like Seven Card Stud. As far as I'm concerned, maybe one day, if they legalize internet hold them or throughout the United States, I'm gonna do what I can to try to make games like that more popular and then all of a sudden you'll have a lot of people playing for the fun of it. How do you think you do that? How do you how do you take a game and make that become more popular? Well, I don't know. Maybe you could start off by offering a game with no rake, do some kind of promotions to get people. I mean there's probably a lot of people who don't want to play it because they never even thought about it. They just remember the games where uh, what they that they saw on television. I really don't know what what would be the best way to do it. Well, I just know that when I first came to Vegas, there were as many live games in Vegas when I first got there, I think, as there are now, and eighty percent of them were stud. They had hold them, but eighty percent of the games were stud. So I think it um, it wouldn't be impossible to have uh, people play games like stud or. Omaha limit Omaha high, for instance, that would be a, a game where where uh, you could really get away with um, playing a lot of hands and getting lucky. I mean, you play pot limit Omaha now. What about have you ever played a limit Omaha? Uh, I can't think of a more not. I mean, that sounds. Have uh, you ever played it? First, answer my question. Have you ever played it? No. That's a great question. I have not played it. Okay, tell me more about this. Well, think about it. I mean, this will, if you're playing limit Omaha, you can't you can't protect your hand like you can in pot limit, and you and you can't really read. I mean, there's all kinds of things. A guy can can play if he wants to. A guy could could play 60% of his starting hands and play an, a 10-hour session and still be ahead because you you know you get your back to a flush. You have your you just you can't knock a guy off a hand, and 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 you also can't figure out what he has all the time because there's always those extra two cards. You he might start off going for one thing. The point is, you can play you can play real loose. A bunch of people can play for fun. They can play real loose, and a and a pro comes in there, and he and and he's going to have an edge, but he's not going to have the kind of edge where he he can um he can lay two or three to one that he's going to win for the at the end of the day. So what we're looking for here is like a a way for fun players to have fun, have a better chance of winning, and sort of limit the professional's edge in a game. Is that kind of what you want? Them, you want you want their you want the volatility to be greater, and you want the rules to be such that you are not punished very badly for playing far more starting hands than what would be theoretically correct. You, in other words. Playing twice as many hands as the as the pro does doesn't punish you that badly, so that you can have fun. That's the whole idea. You're sitting down, you're trying to have fun, you're trying to get lucky, and if you're a fun player, and if a pro comes in there, you don't immediately say, "Oh my God, I can't now. I got to tighten up. I got to. I can't play this way anymore because now it's sucker to him." No, you play that. You play the way you continue to play, and you're going to cause him a lot of headaches. That's actually a really good point. <laughs> Something I, I never thought about it from that, like exactly the way you just worded it. But that's a. That's See, there's a, a lot. Of, there's a lot of amateurs who are who resent pros, not because they're good players, but because they resent the fact that the pros' attitude toward them is, "Oh, you're a sucker. You don't know how to play," and and the and the amateur is basically saying, "Look." If I really had to, you don't think if I, I, especially if the guy's, let's say, a businessman, he's a smart guy, he says, 
to himself, you know, if I really had to, I could play this game as well as you, uh, if I studied it a little bit. I just don't want to. I'm here to have fun. But you're looking at me like I'm, I'm a jerk or I'm an idiot for playing the way I'm playing, and I don't want to play against you because I, I either have to feel like you think of me as a sucker or I have to play a much tighter game and now I'm not enjoying myself. So he doesn't even play at all. Now, if he could, if he could play where, oh, look at this. Joey's coming in this game. I'm going to still play the hands I've been playing, and I'm going to backdoor a lot of hands on him, and he's going to pull his hair out because he can't bet the pot to make me uh, keep me away from those draws. He, all he can do is bet the, the the limit. You know, he might he'll 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 have fun. He'll say he might say, I know in the real long run, Joey's going to still beat me, but I'm going to cause him some ulcers on the way, and that's going to be fun to watch. That's not, well, not fun for me if I'm if I'm Joey in this scenario. But you're well, right. It's not fun because you're in the long run, you are going to get the, get his money. I mean, you can't get his money if he doesn't play. That's really great points. Like, I'm wondering even how you go about implementing something like that, if it's possible, if it could happen, if anyone would get in charge. Because you know, there's people behind the scenes who like make the rules for some of these things, and I don't even know if it could if that could be implemented or if it would happen. Well, I heard there's some limit Omaha games throughout the country in casinos. And that they're wild, and that people love to play them, and and uh, I, I don't know. I think it's the kind of thing that could, you know, it could grow on people. Mm -hmm. I think but, someone, in the chat, someone in the chat said something interesting, and I'm curious to get your take on it. He said, uh, "For a reason," asks, "Why are quote unquote bad players treated with such contempt? It's idiotic." Well, back in my day, that never happened. I think the reason why it happens now is because, see, in my day, the, the, the professional players didn't consider them. They, weren't, they didn't call themselves uh, pros. They called themselves hustlers. I'm a poker hustler. Mm. And, and, of course, the poker, he, they realized back then that they would probably not be happy if a bunch of college students started studying the game in detail. They thought they played well. But they, they thought their main um, ability was romancing and schmoozing the bad players. So back when I first got to, to town, this never happened. But now that the, the, the best players tend to think of themselves in the same way as the best chess players do, they're proud of their, of their uh, skills, uh, and they're not as interested in making money. They're actually, I mean, it was all about making money back when I, when I first hit Vegas. Now there's a lot of players who, who, who yeah, they want to make money, but they also are proud of their skills. And now when a person plays badly and then takes in their, and then, and that, for instance, takes their money, they feel like it's important to let people know that the only reason you took my money was because you got lucky, but I still played the hand correctly and you didn't. Uh, that's just silly. There's no, there's no reason for it, especially if you're seriously playing in that game to make money. So, I, but I, that's my psychoanalysis of why it sometimes happens, because they're looking, their, their, their ego is tied into the, into the game rather than the, um, the fact that they can make money. It's one of the reasons why uh, I think they, there's so much resistance to playing some of these other games. Um, I used to play in the dealer's choice game, and I had a friend who, every time he dealt, he dealt his best game, which happened to be draw poker. And um, I had to really uh, persuade him that when it was time for him to deal, he should deal high well split, which nobody knew how to play at all. But he didn't feel like he had that game down perfectly. I said, I don't care. His name was Peter. Peter. You can make, you'll make so much more money playing high low split because they play it terribly. Draw poker, they play reasonably well. Are, are you here to make money or are you here to show off how good you play? So, so to put it differently, if you're, if you're a serious poker player who's trying to make money, you'd rather be the second best player at the table and everybody else is playing badly than be the best player at the table where everybody else is playing pretty well. But nowadays, a lot of these kids wouldn't. They'd rather be the, they, they would, not like the idea that they're the second best player at the table, even if they can make twice as much money. And, and, and that's, that's all what plays into uh, that question of why you might find a, a, some young kid berating a bad play. 
It's always a very young kid who's doing it. It's never an older an older poker player doing it because so they know they're going to make money. It kind of sounds like you know something online. Uh, I think we made we made a talk about this a bit before. Seat scripting. So seat scripting is where people have a program on these sites that automatically will take the position when a fun player sits down. So it sounds like in a way you almost say like you should do things like that because if you're you should be trying to make as much money as you can for the most part. So if that's going to help you make the most money, you should be doing something like that. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm talking about in a ring game, you should you should not be you should not be berating the bad players. But now this what you're, talking about, okay. what you're talking about, I'm not sure of the details. But of course, if you're going to be playing head up, why wouldn't you play a bad player? I mean, if you're saying are you suggesting that you play? A good player because it's it's a more of a challenge. You could do that once in a while, maybe, but I mean, poker is not like chess or or bridge because if you play if you play chess better than the other guy, everybody knows it quickly. Poker is um, a game where it's a long run game, and um, it's not a each individual hand is almost irrelevant. It's just it's a piling up of, of hours and hours and hours. And the reason to play poker is to make money. I mean it it seems like if you wanted to show up that you're a great game player, you wouldn't even pick poker. Like if that's the reason you're playing. If you're playing poker to win money, that makes sense. If you're playing to show that you're a great game player, then why not pick a game where it will quickly show rather than where you have to take six months before your skill I mean, if two good players play head up, and after a week, player A is a little bit ahead of player B, what's the chances that player A was the better player? Forty? I mean, sixty percent. He could still be the worst player, and he just happened to get unlucky. Uh, so uh, this the, the notion of, of poker being uh, your super skilled plays being what makes you feel good is um, it should be another game. Also, another problem is that some of the plays that that people make that look really um, spectacular are sometimes made by players who are not really as good as the guy who doesn't make the spectacular plays because it isn't the spectacular play that uh, in the long run is what makes the money. In a lot, in a lot of cases, it's plays that uh, you don't even see. I mean, probably the single biggest example of a play you don't even see, and about 40 people are going to want to beat me up for what I'm about to say, <laughs> is that in almost all forms of poker, what you see done wrong is in the multi-way pot on the flop, maybe on the turn, but it would basically usually be, if we're talking hold'em, we're talking on the flop is that if the guy to your right bets and there's two or three people behind you, most people don't realize how good a folding hand could be. See what I'm saying? In other words, uh, well, I mean, uh, for instance, let's just say you were playing no limit. And um, I mean, each situation is different, but the kind of hand that I'm talking about, and by the way, this has been confirmed by those computers that, uh, that do play a little bit of no limit, they do the same thing. But the kind of thing I'm talking about is that the, the, uh, the flop is 10, 8, 4 with two spades, and, um, and the guy to your right bets, two people are behind you, and you have king 10. That would, that's just, almost always just a fold right there. Too many, too many, the combination of all the different kinds of things that can happen. You can get raised behind you, he's already had to beat, if he doesn't have you beat he can he can um, he can draw it on you, you're not drawing to anything, you're, you need it to, anyway that kind of situation, and it doesn't have to be hold them, but that particular fold right there is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to your poker career. So if you could have a guy who realizes to fold hands in that of that nature, who doesn't make the spectacular play of, for instance, 
the flop is queen uh, eight eight, and he checks a guy to his left bets. Another guy calls. He puts them both on eights. He put it. He puts in a big re-raise. They both throw away three eights. He shows nothing. He was representing queens full. He shows nothing, and everybody goes, "Wow." He got two guys to throw away three eights. Meanwhile, he doesn't throw away the king ten in that earlier situation. And when the year is out, he's not doing as well as the guy who didn't try to make that crazy play with the uh, with nothing, but knows the, but knows to throw the king ten away. So the point is, there's a lot of little things going on behind the scenes in poker that adds up to a lot of money, and those people were never going to get the credit. They get it a little bit. Uh, now that you can see everybody's hand, but in some cases they get reverse credit. Like that's one of the things that's been happening to me on Twitch, is that I'm I'm throwing away hands partly because I want to extend my time on the Twitch, but sometimes it's not even close, and people are saying, "Oh, how could you throw that hand away?" And they don't understand that even to this day, a lot of the money that's made in poker is by folding certain hands that you shouldn't that you should fold. But no one ever gets credit for a good fold early in a hand. Now they get credit for a for a great fold on the river. That gets them that gets their ego going. But a fold right in the middle of the hand where there's a lot of things that can happen bad and you and you're adding up all the bad things that can happen and say, you know what, I should just get rid of this hand right now. You will get either no credit or 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 you'll get criticism. And um most of the time, the criticism will be wrong, but but that's another thing about poker. You can't, if you're looking to play for your ego, you're going to be uh, in trouble. You could be in trouble. See, six-handed, no limit hold'em. Um, one of the things about six-handed, no limit hold'em is that there's not too many multi-way pots, and so this particular error doesn't. The opportunity to make this error doesn't come up that often in six hands and no limit hold'em. That's why a lot of people like it. They don't even realize why they like it. Once once you go to nine-handed games, you uh, are more likely to be in multi-way pots, and when you're in multi-way pots, you're more likely to face this situation, and it's a situation that some people don't handle well, and they the easiest way to avoid it is play six-handed. You know, I gotta say, we don't. I don't like talking much strategy on there, but what's that? I don't. I don't usually talk talk much strategy on my PLO stuff or most of my stuff. But what you just said was actually probably the some of the best strategy advice that anyone's given on my on my podcast. And if you're like listening out there and and, and you're trying to get better, like you know, okay, so something a couple people said to me in the chat actually, they said that ask Galansky why he why he's so nitty, and you. Kind of just answered the own question because that, that's what it, like five or six people have said it. when I told you when I said I'm going to have you on. They said to ask you that. Well, part of it is because most, as far as the twitch is concerned, there's a few reasons. Number one is that on a close decision, I'm going to try to, uh, especially when I didn't know how to. If I went broke in one game, I didn't know how to put put another table on there. Now I know how to do that, but there's still <laughs> so few there's still so few places to play that I'm trying to um, I'm trying to uh, Stay in the tournament. So on a close decision, in order to, to keep my uh, my Twitch going, I'm, I, I'm throwing away some close decisions. A second reason is because in a tournament, there's two different reasons. Uh, there's actually three reasons to be a little bit extra nittier in a tournament than in a side game. And uh, but the third and most important reason is that many of the plays that they consider nitty aren't nitty. They're correct, period. They're correct, period, and people just don't get it. You don't, you can't let yourself, when there's three rounds of betting and it's no limit and you're out of position and your hand isn't likely to improve to a big hand, you have to get away from hands where there's many times when you have to fold the hand that if the if the hand stopped right now you would bet even money you have the best hand. You have to fold hands that are likely to be the best hand. In 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 big bet games where you're out of position, your hand isn't going to be improving, 
their hand may be, and not only is that their hand may be improving, but they're in a situation where they can decide whether to keep on firing barrels and um, they may or may not continue to fire barrels while they're bluffing. You see, if, you have, if you're in a situation where, I don't want to get too technical, I could if I wanted to, but I'm not going to get this technical, but if you're in a situation where the guy is bluffing quite a bit on the flop, and then on the turn, he gives up on some but not all of his bluffs. And then on the river, he gives up on even more of, of those bluffs but not all of them. That if he's bluffed, so he, for the sake of argument, he's bluffing 70% of the time on the flop, but then he cuts it down to 30% on the turn, and then he cuts it down to 15% on the river. Mathematically, you're in a situation where rather than have to keep on guessing don't forget if he's if he's 70% on the flop if he's bluffing with 70% of his hands on the flop and then he cuts it down to 35% on the turn then that means that it's still 50-50 he's bluffing it's just that i mean he, the 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 ratio is uh, has stayed approximately the same but you have to keep on guessing and it works out that the best play of all is, is to just to fold immediately, even though you knew you were 70% to have the best hand. I can prove that mathematically. This is, this is actually basic game theory. In fact, Matthew Wanda goes into this in, in great detail. Certainly, if you think you're 55% on the flop, now you might say, well, if you think you're 55%, instead of just calling him and worrying about what he's going to do next, move in, check raise him, right? That, there's a little problem here, though. So you check raise and what happens? When he the forty five percent of the time he, he has you, he calls, and the fifty five percent of the time he's bluffing, he folds. So now you're weighing a price. You're weighing you might be weighing a big price, two to one, and he's forty five percent to have you beat. So that doesn't work either. Anyway, the bottom line is when you're out of position, when the stocks are deep and your hand isn't gonna improve, and the guy behind you, you're not sure what he's doing, and you know now you know that he's going to he's going to keep on reducing his bluffs but not totally the best play against him is to get away from it immediately now if you're up against somebody who you know either is going to bluff continue to bluff no matter you know he's not going to reduce his bluffs or if you know you're up against somebody who takes one stab at it and then gives up if you're up against either one of those two types of players then you can play your 55% hand because what happens? Suppose you're up against a guy who you know he's not going to give up. Well, fine. You check call, check call, check call. Bam. You win a big pot 55% of the time. You lose a big pot 45% of the time. But fine. He's never going to give up. Now, let's say you're up against a guy who you know gives up as soon as you call him. Now you check. He bets. You call. You check again. He bets again. Now you just fold. So that guy you can call him too mm -hmm. but against the guy who gives up on some of his bluffs the first time then some more of them the next time the best play is to just fold immediately so that's the m biggest reason why you'll see me fold hands that a lot of people think I shouldn't though it's almost always going to be when I'm out of position when the stacks are big and when um, my hand can't really improve Th there you'll see me fold hands that are uh, I mean there was a hand I remember one particular hand a guy limped in early position I had ace queen he limped in early position he's got a pretty big hand I, I don't like ace queen offsuit especially with a very big stock especially out of position but I called I figured I hope I hope that it, I can I can see it flop cheap now the guy to my left raised it up to like four and a half big blinds and the next guy called and the guy to my right called I just threw my hand away and people mm -hmm. were saying I could throw ace queen there well it, <laughs> I don't understand why they don't, they don't realize I'm supposed to throw away Ace Queen now. This sounds like a discussion I have with my friends off the stream that I never will put anywhere on the, in the internet. Yes. <laughs> the way, no, just as much like the, the way you talk about it, it's like talking to one of my like uh, younger 20 year old friends about poker. Because you explain, like, it's, uh, it's just. Are you the 20 year old or you're the 20 year old? Oh, well, he's, he's you're, the 20 -year -old. Like, you're in this scenario where like two we're like two PLO players talking about like high level strategy because this is the kind of stuff I talk about with my friends, but 
I never actually like put this on the stream anywhere, but it, it's interesting hearing you say it because I don't I wouldn't look at you as like an online player, but everything you're saying is from a very online standpoint, the way you're talking about things right now. Well, it's, it's not that different in, in, in the live games. I mean, the uh, I, I don't think that those people who think there's a big difference between, I mean, live games tend to be a little bit easier and uh, people are not multi-tabling, but, but, but the, you know, strategy is strategy. But anyway, yeah, so that's, that's some of the reasons why I, I'm nitty. That's, that answers that question. Uh, I feel like you could be, if you play on Poker Stars at, at mid stakes six max or full ring, you could probably win at those games with uh, with a little bit of practice and, and work and work ethic, I guess. Yeah, work ethic. And plus, I have to learn some things that I don't have down cold. I mean, now these guys have things down cold, like given a certain player's range and given a certain flop, they can tell you pretty quickly what the chances are that they flop the best hand. Now, I I wrote about this stuff 20 years ago, but I didn't ever bother to memorize it in detail because one of the reasons I never did is because you only need to know this stuff if you're playing against very good players or yeah. at least pretty good players. I never tried to do that. I learned how to play all the different poker games, and I, was, I used to go as a live player. I used to try to find the easiest game in the room. And when you're playing against bad players, a lot of the stuff is is irrelevant, and therefore I never bothered to study it. I, now, if if I had to, if all of a sudden I went broke and I had to play poker for a living again, some people might be surprised. Now, I don't think now after the, if we if they listen to this last twenty minutes, they would not be surprised. I, I <laughs> well, you know, they say they have they're you know forty five years younger than me, and uh, that's um, that pretty much uh, ends it. You could say that about Walter Brown too. Uh, I don't know if you know who Walter Brown is. He's a chess player. Chess, he's, he's a guy my age, and uh, and uh, he was once the second best chess player in the United States, behind Bobby Fischer. And he's gotten a lot worse. And there's probably three thousand people in the United States who can beat him. But that still means that there's three hundred million uh, who can't. Are you uh, are you writing another book anytime soon about poker theory or about poker specifics? So you were told me you, you mentioned before something about a, a potential story book. I don't know if you're writing any book on actual poker theory. Well, somebody just a few days ago, a, a professional um, I don't want to say who it is, but a professional um, writer approached me with a, a uh, an idea. Happens to be a female, and she. Um, was talking about the idea of spending a year learning poker almost from the beginning, going to the World Series of Poker this year, playing, and then having me spend a year teach her, and she would talk about her exploits over the year. And interspersed with, with that would be po poker advice and also some auto, some biographical stuff because I have a lot of stories. You know, I don't think I have enough stories about Vegas, uh, old time Vegas, and poker to fill a whole book. And I might not have enough about strategy to fill a whole book. And my biography wouldn't be inter that interesting to enough people. But a combination book of of all that, and and then you include whether I can get this uh, lady to become a great player, which I think I can, if she's, if she's a smart woman and she, and she wants to make this a major project, I think I, I'm, I'm, my specialty is teaching people who are beginners to get good, not just at poker, at, at algebra, at probability or whatever. And I think it, would be, it might be fun to, to, to do that book. So it would be written by her, but I'd be a, a big part of it. Wow, That's so one she, book project, maybe. She would spend like two years total time. No, one year. One, one year. year. Okay. I thought. Uh, what was the poker in the world? So start starting at the World Series of Poker this year, and then uh, at, to the World Series of Poker next year. She would be. She that would be uh, her her project. Uh, she's got already got backing for it from her publisher. So be, wow. be interesting. 
where, where, where are you at on that idea? It sounds like you could be interested in that just idea. Started. I just got, I just, she just got in touch with me a few days ago, and I, I told her that um, it sounds good. I mean, so that that might be a book that comes out in a year, and she'll be the author, not me, but it'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be like uh, some autobiographical snippets will probably be in there, and some uh, poker advice. You know, there was uh, the original famous poker book was something called The Education of the Poker Player. It was written in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what that book was. He talked to me, he gave some poker advice. He gave it, it was biographical, etc. Then I still have my project for an algebra book, which I haven't quite done yet. I've had some people approach me to want to help me on that. I'm thinking about writing an algebra book, but no real. Um, maybe a story book. I do it as I, when I say a story book, I mean uh, stories, a book of, of different things I that I know about from from Vegas, but. Uh, I don't know if I can fill a whole book with that. I'm not sure. No, be so I'm not done. I'm not done with my writing, though. There's, there's definitely going to be more stuff coming from me. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked what your two plus two name is. You must not go into his two plus two name is a, a, a red name, David Skolansky in red. So it's a uh, yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty simple name for the most part. Where's my bird? I don't know where she got went. We were asking about that. Did your bird die? What happened to your bird? Oh. Where did she go? I'll, I'm going to try to find her. Oh, there she is. I got her. Where did the bird go? In the ground? Come on. The bird is in the ground. Is everything right? There she is. Lyric. Something wrong. Okay. There she is. This bird is awesome. The bird. There she is. Oh my gosh. Hello. Whoa. Too close, huh? What the <laughs> Okay, she's um. There she is. Uh, the bird's on my head right now. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. There you go. All right, there she is. She's back. This is up close with the bird. Yeah, she's stretching her wings now. And uh, she's on the computer. She's actually on the. Uh, oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> this bird's awesome. Anything else to talk about? Well, in, in, in theory, there's been. There's a, oh, yeah. <laughs> the bird's making some racket over here. And, uh,. There's one thing I want to talk about because it kind of like has to do with the old school, uh, the old school mentality of poker, I guess. The uh, the Eric Lindgren, there was that thread about him recently where he he had a, a bank error, an accidental, I think, accidental two million dollars in his account that he spent on full tilt, and now Poker Stars is suing him for that two point five million dollars. Have you read about that? I've glanced at it. Yeah. That does that. This seems kind of ridiculous from my standpoint. That you would accidentally get two million dollars in your account and then spend it, and then think that you don't owe it or something. Or some people are saying that to get. I don't know, the whole story seems really, really wild to me. As a general principle, I have I have two um, precepts. Number one, I don't like to talk about subjects where I think that. Lots of other people can do as, just as good a job as me talking about. And number two, I don't, I very rarely like to mention people by name uh, if it's something that has to do with a, a negative aspect. Oh, let's see who this is. Do you care if I take this call for a second? Is that, I'll talk to viewers here for a minute. We'll put, we'll put DS on. Uh... Yeah, I'm on, I'm talking. We'll put DS on mute here while he's uh, while he's on the phone. Wait, he says something to me. Let's put him off mute. Wait, I'm not on mute him now. Uh oh. What did I do? Hold on, I put you on mute now. I don't know how to take it off. <laughs> what did I do? Uh, hold on, messed up. What did I do here? 
I noobed it up. Uh, hold on, DS. I put you on mute here. Now I'm trying to fix it. All right, that didn't work. Uh, I might have broke it. <laughs> uh, might need to have DS. Help. We might need to get uh, Sue to help you come back, go go out, and then come back in. All right, yeah, we're gonna have to have uh, we're gonna have to have DS go out and come back in because I muted his audio. He was on the phone, and um, yeah, now he's now he's out of it. So we're gonna have to have Sue go help him figure out how to get back in. So, and then we'll uh, we'll take a couple uh, we'll take a couple more comments and a couple more questions from you guys. I understand. I press mute on the button, and then all of a sudden, just like uh, all of a sudden, it just went away, and now it's gone forever. But his girlfriend is a professional, so hopefully she will she will get things figured out here. We'll see what happens. Who do we got out there in the chat, man? We got a lot of we got some new a lot of new names out there. I don't know. Welcome to is this your first time? Welcome to the stream. We got a couple of regulars out there. Sir Gold and Silverworm, what's up, puppy? Nothingness for show. PTAB Josh. What else is here? Let's see. Let's see. Epicurus. What's up, Epicurus? Please ask him if he believes women should be allowed to hold public office. What? Why would I ask him that? I don't think that. It's not asking that question. Matt Campbell. What's up? What's up? Gito. What's up, Gito? Ashley Delaney. What's up? My boy, Andreas. What's up, Andreas? Kevin Clarkson. Danny B. Wim. What's up, Wim? Rems, what's up, Rems? We got a lot of people out there today. Oi, oi, what's up, Tobias? What's up, boys? Andreas says his daughter started walking today. I'm scared for your daughter's future. Send a message, send a DS a message over on two plus two. Telling him, come back in. Come back in, puppy. And we'll see if uh, we can get back in. If not, we're going to wrap it up. What's up, Sammy? Reg listener, noob chatter here, puppy. What's up, puppy? Heads up challenge. Uh, Donger Cam is playing. Uh, he's playing Valentine's Day, I believe. So he is not. He won't be. He won't be uh, not playing today. What Corm Storm? Corm the Storm said, I have every intention of becoming a stream reg. That's good to hear, Corm the Storm. Welcome to the stream, man. I like YouTube. I like the YouTube chat much better than Twitch chat. Twitch chat is. For those guys that were there yesterday, we had like a thousand people in there. That was crazy. There was it was chaos. Thank you to G Dell. G Dell was doing a good job as a moderator. Rems. Rems was doing it. Rems has some moderating to learn how to be a better moderator, but Rems did a good job too. We got love for Rems. PTAP, what's up, PTAP? Rick 700 says, same here. He's looking to be a. Uh, we're still waiting for DS to get back. Sure, you aren't. Says you're not allowed to join this chat. Oh my God. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm not fucked up. Whoops. Uh, oh. I'm not fucked up. <laughs> Now we got it. We're gonna have to go to the back channel. Any way I can, uh, any way I can do it. Hmm. Open it up, boys. Is Brian okay? Brian's okay. My friend Brian that joined yesterday. Sir Golden says, "I want to see the heads up challenge. I watched the YouTube of it. I'm gonna watch the Twitch too." I put yeah, I put the uh, the challenge last night onto. I put the challenge onto my YouTube last night. Yeah, I banned. Apparently, I banned DS from the from the chat somehow. So that's not good. Whoops. Let's get this back in here. Come on. Let's see if we can. Uh, if not, we might just start part two. 
Okay, let me let me try this one more time. We gotta get creative. We gotta get creative. We gotta get creative. I have 1001 messages. That's pretty sweet. This is my working face, guys. I'm trying to work around this and see. Here's the help article on Hangouts, muting. Thank you, thank you. Hayes wants to see a WCG pickup maneuver. I think you can't, you, unless you're six, if you're six three, I'll tell you the pickup maneuver, but if you're not six three, then I won't teach you the pickup maneuver because it's not gonna matter. Oh. Yeah, if, if I can't get this back to working, guys, I'll just start up a new one, and uh, we'll get that going. If I get, if I do start up a new one, I'm going to put the link in the description, and I'll put it on my Twitter and my Facebook group. Actually, I'll just put the link in the description for it, and I'll put it back on my on my YouTube and my Twitter page. If you can't come back in. Because I fucked up. I'm like a noob. What a new man. Is six two enough? If you're six two, you could probably do it, yeah. I think so. I'm gonna have to change my tweet with the pirate pick. Yeah, it might be might be starting a new one here, boys. I guess we just caught a part one and a part two. That's a case. All right, guys, we're going to start part two. I'll, uh, I'll put the link in the description. I'm going to put it in there right now. Just refresh the link. And, uh, yeah, just refresh the... Just refresh the link right now. It should be in there. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Be back in a sec. 